Abram, and uh, this was before he became Abraham. Okay, so if you're ever wondering what Abram and Sarai's name were, it was Abram and Sarai. They would later become Abraham and Sarah. Okay, kind of like Abraham over uh, um, Abram, but you know, we can just call him Abram for short. Now, in we're going to be looking at five different little snippets or uh, lessons that we can learn from Abram. Now I want you to look here at this first verse. It says, The Lord said to Abram, He said, I want you to go from the Ur of the Chaldees, because that's where he, he was living when he originally started off. Okay, And then they they settled in Haram. That, that It's kind of a, um, a city about uh, 450 miles north of Canaan. Okay, In modern day Iraq. Okay, just let you know where it is. And uh, and so the area of the Chaldees is almost down towards the um, towards the uh, Persian Gulf. Okay? So he made a huge trip with his father Terah, and they settled in Haram for a period of time. And while they were there, they had been accumulating people, accumulating stuff. And then God says, Now it is time for you to leave and head down to Canaan. Now, as we learned last time in the Bible study, we discovered that Canaan is actually the son of a guy named Ham. And Ham, okay, um, his claim to fame was that he saw his dad drunk and kind of naked. And uh, he laughed at his dad, and his dad um, uh, basically got mad, and uh, his son, Canaan, which was cursed. And you think to yourself, that sounds really very bad. But you see, God saw something that was going to happen to Canaan, and Canaan would become a real heathen. I mean, he was a bad boy. And his descendants would then become not so good. In fact, they would become idol worshippers. Now, why did God send Abram to uh, Canaan? Now, some people say, well, that's the land that he belongs to. That was the land that God made. No, there was a, a secondary reason, and the secondary reason that Abram went to Canaan was that God wanted to put a light in the midst of a dark place. Isn't that wonderful to know? Do you know that right now you are a light in a dark place? Wherever you are working, in whatever complex you're living, whatever home, whatever street, whatever neighborhood you are living, you are actually a light in a dark place. Do you know that anyone who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior lives in darkness? In fact, the Bible calls them blind. One of the themes of the book of John was, those that are able to see, they do not see. Those who are able to hear, do not hear. Those who walk in darkness will see a great light. So here we have Abram. You know, you think, well, that's a wonderful promise. You know, he's going to take this land, and I mean, it's going to be absolutely fabulous. Did you know that Abram lived his entire life in tents? Would you like to be camping all the time? I mean, camping is wonderful, okay? It's okay for a week or two, but you imagine living in a tent all your life, and your, grand, your son living in a tent all his life. And his grandson living in a tent all your life. I mean, tents are nice. Come on. I mean, you can blow up the old uh, um, air mattress, you know, put out some lights and that sort of thing. But one of the things that happens when you're in a tent is you're exposed to all the elements. Now, in those days, they did not have central heating. In fact, my daughter lives in Japan. Did you know that the houses in Japan do not have central heating? Not one of them. They don't have central heating. Each room has an individual heater. And my daughter, when she goes into her bathroom, her bathroom is not heated at all. All I can say is, I would not want to sit on one of those seats. I did. And my, I went, whoo -hoo -hoo! <laughs> You say, Pastor, what does that do with anything? Folks, you know what it's like. Have you have you ever tented in Banff, 
or Jasper National Park in the middle of summer and it goes down to below zero because it does do that because it happens to be elevated you know I mean Jasper is up around 5,000 feet okay and so is Banff and I remember when we were uh, tenting in Waterton National Park for the very first time and I slept in this sleeping bag and I got out and all of a sudden I thought whoo it's cold here that's what he was dealing with all the time the desert does get cold okay there are times of the year that it's very cold and so Abram lived in all of that time he never ever had a uh, a, uh, a piece of land his own the only place that he ever owned was his own gravesite the cave of Malpelech. That's the only place he ever owned. So here you have this wonderful problem. God says, I'm gonna, I'm, I want you to go to a land which I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And ever who curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now here's a guy that leaves where he is. I mean, he was in Hiram. They probably had a nice house. Maybe. We don't know. Okay? They had been established there for quite a while. And now he moves all these people. Now, folks, how big was his particular group? Well, we do know that there were 318 men that were part of his household army. So when he went after, and we'll be talking about that in a couple moments, when he went after the enemies of, of, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah, he had 318 men. So he had a big household. Just think about this. He probably had over a thousand people in his troop. A thousand people. That is, a, that is not a small family. That is a town, right? It is. And he would say, okay, everybody, let's move. And they did. And and that's, you know, and he said, okay, we're going to head off. You know, they're, they're thinking, this is Hiram. This is a nice place. Hiram is a nice place. It's an oasis, okay, in the middle of the desert. Has lots of uh, lots of, uh, of trees and, and, and places to go that are very nice, right? And all of a sudden, now, he's got to go to a place he's never been before. And I want to tell you something. Israel is a nice place, but it's not as nice as some places in Canada. All right? This is just not. I mean, when you think about the Jordan River, the Jordan River is not much bigger than the Sturgeon. Did you know that? I've been there. You've been there too, haven't you, Leo? It's not a big river. Okay? It's like the Sturgeon River. And it's about as long as the Sturgeon River, by the way. So it gives you kind of a little focal point. The Dead Sea is... Uh, 18 miles wide by about 60 miles long. It's about the same size or just a little bit under the size of the Lesser Slave Lake. We have some pretty big lakes in Canada, right? We have lakes that are 12,000 square miles. I used to live by the, uh, by the Great Slave Lake. The Great Slave Lake is 120 miles by 370 miles, okay? Covers 12,000 square miles miles. It is the deepest lake in all of North America. They haven't been able to find the bottom. Okay? I've lived by big lakes. So he's called to go to this place and he says, this is the blessing. He says, I'm going to make a great nation and through you all nations are going to be blessed. So what does he do? He just goes and do it. You know, faith has two blessings. Faith always recognizes and stands on the promise. And next, faith is obedient to what God tells us. We say, God, what do you want us to do? I'll do it. Where do you want me to go? I'll go. Why do you want me to do it? He'll tell you. He'll tell you also when and who we are to be. All we're called to be is obedient. Faith is action, and he went to Canaan. Now, the next lesson we learn is that the first thing he did in Genesis chapter 6, I'm sorry, 12, verse number 8, what did he do? The very first thing he did when he got to Canaan. He stops everybody. He says, okay, folks, there's one thing that I need to do right away. What was the thing that he did? He built an altar to God. That's what he did. 
He built an altar, and he, he offered sacrifices. Why did he do that? Well, you say, well, he made a long journey. No. Right from the very beginning, Abram wanted to honor God. You see, the reason he was in Canaan is because God called him there. Now, I don't know the particular reason why you live in St. Albert. I can tell you why my sister moved to St. Albert. She, lived, she wanted to move to St. Albert because she thought it was a nice place to live. And there's lots of people that live in different places for different reasons. But have you ever thought for a moment that God would call you to a particular community to do a particular thing? That has been my testimony. The only reason I'm living in St. Albert is because God called me here. Okay? That's the only reason I'm here. Okay? I'm not going to lie to you. Okay? And if God were to call me someplace else, I would go someplace else. Why? Because the simple fact is, I don't live where I am for my own reason. I live here because God called me here. Okay? I don't know why you live where you are or what you do, why you do. Is it because God called you or is it because the simple fact is this is where you happen to find yourself? Well, all I know is this. Wherever you are called, you are to bloom where you're planted. Amen? Yeah. It is not an accident that you live where you are and that you're coming to this church and listening to this message this morning. God wanted to speak to you about a simple fact is that where you are, God has called you to be. In that place, what did He do? He called on the name of the Lord. God was involved in every major decision that Abram made. Abram wanted to start off well. He also, through his life, would call on the name of the Lord multitudes of time because God was the reason why he was in Canaan. God had called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees, had called him out of Haram to come to Canaan. That's why he was there. He knew that he had the blessing of God upon his life. Do you know that you have the blessing of God upon your life? If you haven't figured it out, you should. Because God wants to bless you. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life, and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. That's one of my favorite songs. More abundantly, more abundantly, that we might have life, and more abundantly. I can sing better than that. You know that. But the point that I want to say is that God wants to bless you abundantly. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to bless you abundantly. Just turn to your neighbor. Maybe it's the first time you've talked today. That would be lovely. All right? That's what he wants to do. Abram knew that God was the center of the reason why he was there. Life was comfortable in the Ur of the Chaldees. Believe it or not, the Ur of the Chaldees was a modern city as far as Babylon was concerned. It was one of the top cities. You, he was called away from a top city to go and live in a tent for the rest of his life. I don't know about you, but if God said, sell your house and go live in a tent for the rest of your life, let's say in Saskatchewan, I would really question the call of God. I want to tell you a little story. Up north, there is a community called Osdenburg. Okay, that's in northern Ontario. And there was a, a woman who was called to go to Osdenburg. And she went up there. It's a First Nations uh, place, by the way. And she went there and uh, she rented a house. And then the chief found out why she was there. She wanted to establish a mission work. Well, he was anti-mission work and anti-Christian. So what did he do? He booted her out of her house and said, You cannot stand and you cannot live on the reserve. So you know what she did? She got one of those, those. Um, uh, the only way I can describe it is, is kind of a canvas tent. She put a little pot-bellied stove in the middle of it, and she lived on the edge of the reserve all winter. And would go in and would stand at the, at the crossroads, like the entrance, and stop vehicles and say, can I tell you about Jesus? 
And she did that. And folks, if you have ever been to northern Ontario, it gets to minus 50. And it was an extremely cold winter. Finally, the people said, you got to let her into the reserve. She's got to have a place to live or she'll die. And if she dies, that's going to be on our head. And so finally the chief relented and let her move back into the reserve. And then she was able to establish a church. Amen? Now talk about persistence. But if God told me to do that, I'd wonder if God was sugar in the head. Anyway, the third lesson we can learn from him is that we learn that family and friends are important. Did you notice here in verse number uh, four, it says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Aram. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew Lot, all his possessions, all they had accumulated, and all the people. He discovered that people were important. That the blessing of God was on him when he included his family in the situation. When I met Lois back in 1977, I remember I walked, uh, we were, we were uh, at Bible College, at Northwest Bible College. That was when it was back down 116th, 116th Street, 107th Avenue. And uh, my wife told me that uh, that particular morning, I had shook her hand twice. Okay? I don't remember that. But I do remember shaking the hands of every pretty girl in the school. I wanted to make sure that they knew I was available. Okay? The next day, my wife showed up in the same class. I was a year ahead of her, but I had taken mid-semester. So I was taking my first year. I'd already taken the second half of my first year. And I was starting the second half, or the first half, of my first year. And so she sat down beside me, and God looked over, and, uh, and she looked over me and, and kind of, you know, I was, I think that morning I was wearing overalls. I had a big fuzzy hair, aviator glasses that were, you know, tinted, and a big mustache, you know, long hair down about here, that type of situation. And she was this girl fresh out of Prairie Bible Institute. I mean, she, she had the long thing there. The, you know, she looked like Farrah Fawcett is who she looked like, okay? That's probably why I noticed her. Anyway, um, she looked over at, at me, smiled, and then God said, that's the man you're going to marry. And she said, not him. <laughs> well, you know what? God took us, and we created a family later on after we got married. And today our family is all serving the Lord, and our grandchildren are all serving the Lord. You see, when you decide to become a Christian, one of the promises that God gives you, and maybe you haven't seen it fulfilled yet, but it is a promise of Acts 16.31 that says not only will your family, you will be saved, but your family as well. Amen? Amen. So if your family is not saved, keep praying, because that's the promise. Amen? If you have family, continue to influence them. Abram was an influence not only on Lot, not only on Sarah, but everyone that came into his, um, into his sphere of influence. Interesting thing about Abram was this, that he would tell everybody why he was there. He says, they say, why are you here? Because God called me. Now, you have to live, understand, in those days, everybody was polytheistic. What is polytheistic? Polytheistic means that they, they worship many gods. They would say, which god? He would say, the God of the universe. Oh, you must be talking about Ra. No, no, not Ra. Are you talking about Moloch? No, I'm not talking about Moloch. Are you talking about Milkon? No, I'm not talking about Milkon. Are you talking about Chemosh? No, no, no. I'm talking about Adonai, Yahweh, the one who created all things. These other gods are, are stone and idols. Can you imagine telling all these people that all the gods that they were worshipping were stone and idols? Wood and nothing else. They can't hear. They can't see. They can't speak. You know what the Bible says? Any idol, any stone that people would worship, were actually, they were worshiping demons is what they were doing. Okay? These were demon worshipers. So here is Abram as a light in that generation saying, listen, the reason I'm here, the reason why we're, we're living here in Canaan, going from place to place, is because we are serving the God who created all things. 
and He loves you, and He wants you to have a relationship with Him. And that's why He was there, all right? And so we have this wonderful thing. Now, there was an interesting incident that I'm going to talk about for just a moment, okay? For just a moment. <clears throat> the Bible says that there was a quarrel between Lot's herdsmen and, and um, Abram's herdsmen, all right? They got into a fight over land. The land could not support both of them. So, Abram comes up with an idea. He says, why don't you and I separate? You go where you want to go, and I will go where I want to go. I will stay, you know, away from you. So what does Lot do? Lot says, hey, I'm going down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the Bible says that he went down there, first of all, to live by the cities. Then, over time, he moved into the city. And then, over time... He became a leading citizen of that city. Now, what was Sodom and Gomorrah's claim to fame? Well, immorality. Okay? Immorality. And so when the angel of the Lord and the Lord himself came to visit, he says, I've heard there's a great cry of wickedness. I want to go down and see what's going on. You know what? Abram began to uh, understand what was going to go on. And uh, and uh, actually, I want to back up for a moment. I want to back up to the fact that uh, in, in Genesis chapter 14, the Bible says that there was a war, okay, between the five kings uh, that were ruling over Sodom and uh, that were ruling over Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah, the king of Sodom, was his name was Barak. Okay, and Barak led a a uh, war or a rebellion against these five kings. The f the king of the other confederation was a guy named Chelamar. Okay, and the two of them clashed together, and guess what? The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah lost, and so these five kings federation came down into Sodom and Gomorrah and took everybody out of Sodom and Gomorrah, including Lot and his family. Okay. Someone came to Abram, said, Abram, there's a problem here. And the problem is that uh, your uh, nephew has been taken captive. You know what he did? He got his household army together and he chased them down and he defeated them. Now you say, how can 318 men defeat the entire armies of this whole five confederation? When God is on, on your side... One can chase a hundred, two can chase a thousand, three can chase a million, amen, if you do the math, all right? He was able to defeat them. He was able to restore uh, Lot and all the people. And it was interesting that when Bera, the king of Sodom, came to him and said, what would you like to return? We will give you all the plunder. You know what he said? Nothing. He says, I want nothing from you. Now, why did he do that? Because he knew that anything that came from the world would taint the call of God. I want to just bring a quick thing. Don't let anything in this world take you away from the call of God. Take you away from the relationship that you have. There's always going to be all kinds of things that will come from the world that will tempt you. And the enemy knows exactly where to attack you. Alright? Jesus had a young man who came to him and he said, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, no problem, follow me. There's only one thing you need to do. Give up your wealth. The Bible says that young man went away from him because he loved his wealth more than righteousness. There are many people in this society that love the things of this world more than the things of God. Abram had wanted nothing to do that. He knew that his source, he knew the one that would bless him would be the Lord. Do you believe that yourself? Do you believe that God can bless you? That you don't have to be tainted by the things of this world? That's why he refused to do it. He says, I am not going to have you people of Sodom and Gomorrah with your immoral ways telling me that somehow you blessed me and make me rich. He says, I want nothing to do with that. He says, only the men who... God thinks, he says, we just want the food and a little bit of things that need to, you know, the supplies that we lost. That's all we want. Otherwise, I want nothing to do with that. All right? 
Well, I could talk about Melchizedek, but I'm not going to talk about him today. Okay? I do want to tell you, though, that there was something significant that happened after that. And that something significant that happened when it came to uh, to uh, Sodom or to Lot and this whole situation was this. You have Abram when the angel of the, the Lord himself and the two angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened? Well, what happened was this, that they went down and they discovered how terrible Sodom and Gomorrah were. Now, what did Abram do or Abraham do? Abraham, in, in Genesis chapter 18, verses 15 to 35, pled for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, why did he plead for Sodom and Gomorrah? It's quite simple. The reason he pled for them is because he sacrificed his army and his people to save Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a relationship between them. That's why he fought for them in prayer. He said, listen, Lord, will you not destroy, will you destroy the righteous and the unrighteous together? He says, no, I won't. If you can find 50 people, he says, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for 50 people? He says, no. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? They couldn't even find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. They couldn't find them. And so he pled with them. The lesson that we can learn today from this particular situation is you and I are called to intercede for our nation. We are to pray for those around us. And it's a privilege to do that. This story in the Old Testament concerning Abram and or Abraham, okay, because that's who he was by this time, okay, when he pled for that nation, for when he pled for those cities, he knew how bad they were. <coughs> And yet, he was willing to do that. We know that our society is bad. Amen? It's a bad place. But we are still called to pray for them. Because God has called them to be salt and light. Amen? That's a lesson that we can learn from him. And the last lesson I want to leave with you is, is patience and trust. It says here, I will bless, he says, I will make your day and you will be a blessing. Now, one of the promises that he gave him is that he was going to give him a son. Now, how old was he when he left? He was 75 years old. How old was he when he had his son? He was 100 years old. Okay? Long past, whenever they could have children. Sarah was 90. And when she was 65, they made a promise. They said, you're going to have a kid. <laughs> Can you imagine being 65 years old? You know, and being told that you're going to have a kid? Then you'd have to wait another 25 years to make that happen. Now, I've used you as an example before, Leora. You're just a, a little past 90, right? Just a little past. Can you imagine God coming to you at your age and saying, Guess what? You're having a kid. I uh, see her roll her eyes. She rolled her eyes. Wow. You know? The thought of having a child at that age is, I mean, it's beyond comprehension, right? And yet. God gave them the child. Now they did try to short circuit it by having uh, by Abram sleeping with Hagar, and we all know what's going on because of that. Amen. Let me tell you something. Don't try to short circuit the plan of God because you're going to create all kinds of problems. Amen. Stay to the plan. Stick to the plan. Otherwise, you're going to have all kinds of problems. We have the lesson of faith, the lesson of persistence. All right. He never gave up. When faith says when God promises He will do something, He will deliver. What we have to do is we have to wait for the fulfillment. Not only did He wait, but Sarah waited as well. The thing that I thought was very interesting about the Sodom and Gomorrah situation is at the same time, the Lord said, next year you're going to have a baby. And the Bible says that Sarah laughed within herself, right? And then the Lord, of course, caught her on it. She says, I didn't laugh. He says, yes, you did. You can't fool God, right? But you know, interesting, what does the name Isaac mean? Isaac means laughter. That's what it means. You know, she laughed about it. And then she named her child Isaac because it was, a, it was an amusing situation. But you see, what we need to do is we need to stand upon, thus saith the word of the Lord. 
Because what will happen is if we're honest and if we stay to the plan, God will give us in time our fulfillment. Amen? That's the marvelous thing about serving the Lord. So God later on renamed Abram and Sarah to Abraham and Sarah. Why? Because of their faith and trust in God. And these are the lessons that we can learn. We could talk about many more lessons. But the reality of the situation is, if you put your trust in God, God will hear, God will answer, and God will bring the victory. Amen? Let's stand together right now. Praise Father, there are many lessons that we could learn.